Hello, everybody, and welcome back to history class. All right, so today, continuing off of some of the stuff that we know about Napoleon from last time, we are going to give a more full story about Napoleon Bonaparte, one of the most important people in Western history. All right, so we're going to take a look at Napoleon Bonaparte's life a little bit, his legacy, and the Congress of Vienna, basically the wrap up of the demise of Napoleon. All right, so let's go ahead and begin. So Napoleon Bonaparte was born on the island of Corsica in 1768. This is a Mediterranean island off the Western coast of Italy. Corsica originally had belonged to Italy and then France had conquered it at one point in its past. And Napoleon is descended from a line of Italian nobility that lived on the island. And so in actuality, he is ethnically an Italian, not French. That's something interesting for you to know about him. Now, as you can see here at the bottom bullet, at age nine, he's going to enroll in a French military school. So even from a young age, he was like destined to be in the military, to be a great general. Now, he would often get teased for his Corsican accent and which was, you know, it had an Italian influence mixed in with French. So it kind of sounded a little odd to all of the quote unquote, prim and proper French people of Paris. And also he got beta fun of for his height, which was five three. So he, he wasn't exactly like super short, but he wasn't tall either. He was kind of average, a little below average for a man at this time. All right, the average height for a, a man during this time, I think was like five six, five seven. So he was a little on the short side. But as you might expect, if you know anything about Napoleon from before today, uh, he is going to really shine when it comes to his mind. He was a brilliant military strategist and he would be, really gain a knack for cannons. Artillery was his first big thing that he became known for. He basically came up with these ideas on how to use cannons to basically command the battlefield so that, you know, you provide cover for your troops as they're marching into position with like intense cannon fire and like the enemy wouldn't know what to do type of deal. Now, during the French Revolution, Napoleon is going to win important battles against Austria and Prussia. Now, if you remember from when we were talking about the French Revolution a couple, that was a few days ago, I, was, I believe it is, uh, you would know that in response to the revolution taking hold and the monarchy being overthrown in France, that neighboring countries like Austria and Prussia, uh, they took note of that and did not like it because they didn't want these revolutionary ideas to spread into their own kingdoms and overthrow their monarchies. So they attack to try and crush the revolution and reinstate the French monarchy. But they had to contend with the brain of Napoleon Bonaparte. So he's going to win major battles against the Austrians and the Prussians, driving them out. And he's also going to become the savior of the directory. This is like the government that takes over after the monarchy is uh, killed off. And so he basically saves the re revolution by protecting these guys. Uh, basically the royalists, the people who are trying to get rid of the directory and bring the monarchy back. Uh, he scares them off by shooting cannons at them in the streets of Paris. All right. Now, 1799, Napoleon is going to launch a coup d'etat that is a sudden and usually violent seizure of power, overthrowing a government and in, instating yourself in place. 
He's going to overthrow the directory, which has become weak and corrupt. And he is going to become the first consul or dictator of France. So he is now the head of the government. All right. So that was 1799. Now, even though France just seven years earlier had gotten rid of Louis the 16th, a king, why would the people support Napoleon in basically becoming a monarchist type figure? And it all comes down to this one fact we see here at the bottom. Would the people rather have peace and order or bloodshed and like who knows what's gonna happen tomorrow? People want stability and where they're gonna find stability at this time in France's history is under the rule of Napoleon. So a couple more years go by, about five years, and he is going to crown himself emperor of the French. And this little thing here about him grabbing the crown out of the Pope's hands, that's because kings and emperors in Europe before this, they were crowned by the Pope or by a high ranking church official saying that God is allowing this person to be the new ruler. And Napoleon, by symbolically taking the crown from the Pope and then placing on his own, is like, I have made myself the emperor, no one else. And he is then going to crown his wife, Josephine, as the empress. All right. And this is signifying his power over the Catholic Church. He makes the rules, no one else. And everyone knows it. All right. Now he is going to get a divorce. All right. A couple of years after this, so four years after becoming emperor and empress, he is going to let his wife Josephine know that in the interest of France, he must find a wife who could produce an heir, who can give him a son. So he divorces his wife Josephine, who really was the love of his life. Uh, like, she even cheated on him at one point. He took her back and she was loyal to him after that. But then the fact that, and she was a little older than he was too. She was a widow. Uh, she had a previous husband who had died. She had a couple kids. And Napoleon basically took it, the whole family in as his own. But uh, yeah, he's going to leave her. He's going to marry a much younger woman, a 19 year old a princess from Austria named Marie Louise. And yeah, this is going to gain him an ally in Austria, but not really anything else besides that. Now, things that Napoleon is going to accomplish while he is in charge of France. He builds the biggest empire that Europe has seen since Rome was in existence. He's going to sell the Louisiana Territory to the United States in 1803 for $15 million. And the reason why is because, well, America wants to expand. He needs money for funding his wars in Europe. So, and he's not, France isn't doing anything with that land. So it's like, you know what? You want it? Here's the price tag. I'll, I'll take a check. All right. He's also going to set up a fair tax code. So taxes are more evenly distributed, like in, who, in the amounts that people pay, no matter their social class. Government positions are going to be filled by people who can actually do the jobs, less likely to be corrupt in this fashion. Public schools are going to become available to all people. All right. The Catholic Church is going to regain prominence in France, and we're going to see the creation of the Napoleonic Code, which is a set of laws that still is a heavy influence in France today. So he did a lot of good things for France, besides the military victories. Like government-wise, he ruled very well. All right, Napoleonic Code, 1804, comes into existence equality of all citizens under the law. All right. 
People can choose whatever profession, whatever job they want to have. They are not stuck doing what their parents did before them. Religious tolerance and the serfdom, all feudal types of obligations. So like people being tied to the land they live on and serving under a Lord that no longer applies to people. They are free to roam and move to new cities, to new places, whatever they want, they can do it if they can afford to do it. All right, right here, this is the extent of Napoleon's empire. So you have the solid light pink right here. This is directly under his control. All right, the lines, the white lined areas, like uh, this part of Germany, you got Poland, You've got Spain. These are areas who are under French control. And then you have all the darker shaded areas. This, these be, are areas that become allies to France. So he has sway over a very, very large piece of territory here. Now, nationalism Napoleon is going to, with all his new policies, he's going to bring nationalism to one of the highest levels that France has ever seen in its entire history. And nationalism is this like super love and pride in your country. So the French is like, we are the best, no one can beat us. That's the mentality that we're going. So in the areas that France has defeated, there's a very, very strong hatred towards the French and Napoleon especially. So this is going to then lead to resistance against the French and it's going to resolve into like all out war. The wars never end when Napoleon's involved. All right. So while Napoleon did a lot of really good things, he does make three stupid mistakes. One is the continental system, one's the Peninsular War, and one is the invasion of Russia, a lesson that many people will fail to learn. All right, so number one, the continental system. Napoleon is going to attempt to set up a naval blockade preventing Britain from trading with the rest of Europe. Basically, he's going to try and use his, the French Navy, as a wall to block the British from getting to mainland Europe. Now, a lot of nations are going to ignore this and Britain is going to be able to slip through because let's face it, the French Navy isn't big enough to block off the whole continent from the island of Britain. And seeking revenge, the British are going to launch their own blockade of France, like through all their seaports, which is gonna hurt France a lot economically because the British Navy is the biggest Navy in the world at this time. They are the best equipped, the best trained. They got the biggest guns and they're blocking off a much smaller territory. They're only blocking off France. Whereas Napoleon's trying to block off all of Europe. It's uh, pretty much a lose-lose for Napoleon on that one. The Peninsular War is when France attacks Spain. All right, he's going to, because they ignore the continental system, because they do business with the British. So over the course of six years, Spain is going to use guerrilla warfare, ambush tactics, fighting and running, doing all that type of stuff that you, that we saw in the French and Indian War in North America. Spain is using those tactics against the French. All right, massive casualties in the French army. The British, they were helping out Spain here as well. And then we have the invasion of Russia, perhaps the single biggest mistake that Napoleon ever made. He's going to invade Russia for trading with Britain in violation of the continental system. And as he's marching into Russia, the Russian army is retreating drawing them deeper into Russia. They're burning everything in their path, the Russians. They're not leaving anything for the French. This is a scorched earth policy. Leave nothing behind that the French can use. All right. Now, 
there's never a surrender from the Russians and Napoleon decides that he needs to retreat when winter starts to set in. No major battles are really fought. It's more just skirmishes, little fights here and there. And so <laughs> between 470,000 and 530,000 of his troops out of 685,000 roughly between 685 and 700,000 troops are killed by Russian troops. They either starve to death or they freeze to death. That is catastrophic losses, no matter whose army it is. He lost a good, let's see, that would be a good three quarters of his troops, basically. Like anywhere from like two thirds to three quarters. Very, very bad loss. All right. Now, after that very, very big problem of Russia, uh, he's going to be defeated by a combined British, Russian, and Prussian army, and he's going to be banished to an island called Elba in the Mediterranean Sea, and he basically gets to run this little island like he's the king of it, but he is just not allowed to leave it. It's The population is small enough where he can never like have anything more than like a police force to protect the island, and that's about it, but... He's going to escape a year later, and he's going to arrive back in southern France, and he is going to march and with the few men that he brought from Elba, and armies are going to be sent against him to stop him, and he's going to step out in front of the armies and go, who would, who would dare shoot their emperor? And then like the army that is there to stop him ends up joining him. So he's gaining more and more soldiers the further he's getting with getting close to pa <clears throat> with getting close to Paris. All right. Now he basically just walks right into Paris. He takes over being emperor again and he's welcomed home. And this is the beginning of the of Napoleon's 100 days. 100 days of him being back in power, I should say. So then, uh, because the rest of Europe is terrified of Napoleon and what he is capable of, the British and the Prussians are going to attack and meet him in Belgium near the town of Waterloo. Napoleon and his army, who is mostly inexperienced because all of his best troop, a lot of his really good troops, his veterans died in Russia, uh, they are going to be quickly defeated like his young troops they're going their lines are going to break they're going to shatter into retreat uh only the only ones that are really left are his what are called the old guard which are like his only veterans that are left and they they basically fight to the last man and they're all killed off he gets captured and he gets exiled to saint helena which is an island in the south atlantic ocean off the coast of africa Basically, there's no way he's coming back from this one. All right. And at Waterloo, he was defeated by this guy, the Duke of Wellington. And he's basically the English version of Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, Napoleon is going to die six years later on St. Helena from stomach cancer in 1821. There's a lot of controversy. A lot of people think that the British had him poisoned because of you know the threat that he still posed by being alive. So, you know, there's some leeway there. There's conspiracy about it. So no one's actually positive unless some paper gets found in some ancient archive saying like that gives the order to execute him by poison. We'll never know for sure. All right, the legacy of Napoleon and the Congress of Vienna. This is basically the wrap up. All right, his legacy. He tried to unify all of Europe. It didn't work out. He did set up the Napoleonic Code, which is a set of laws that is still in practice now, at least a lot of it. All right. 
These are all some of the aspects of the Napoleonic Code. Some of these would stay, some of them would not. All right. The growth of nationalism happens under him, which is, you know, it's good for a country to have nationalism. It's good for the people to be proud of their country. But nationalism's flaw is people get a little too rambunctious thinking that they're the best and no one's better than them. So everyone else is inferior and should be under their control. So you got to keep a, a balance when it comes to nationalism. All right. The Congress of Vienna. This is basically what do we do with Europe now that Napoleon's out of the picture? So ambassadors from all the different European states are going to be coming together. And the whole committee is going to be chaired by the Austrian statesman Clemens von Metternich. It's going to be held in Vienna, Austria, which is the capital of Austria. And it's going to go for, let me see. It's going to go on for about eight months. And we're going to, and none of the negotiations are going to really, it's going to take a long time to get things rolling. Let's just put it that way. Now, the five major powers that are being represented are Austria, Prussia, Russia, Great Britain, and France. And a lot of lesser nations. You're going to have like Belgium there. You're going to have the Netherlands there. You're going to have representatives from other places. But these are the main ones. And the most important figures come from here. So like Austria, we have Clemens von Metternich and Emperor Francis I, who are going to be speaking on their country's behalf. Prussia, we're going to have Karl von Hardenberg, Wilhelm von Humboldt, and King Frederick William III of Prussia. All right, from Russia, we have Count Karl Nesserod and Tsar Alexander I. And from Great Britain, we have Robert Stuart. We have the Duke of Wellington, Arthur Wellesley. And we have Richard Trench. And from France, we have Charles Maurice de Talleyrand. And this guy, he's going to do the best that he can to get a decent deal for France. It's not going to work out the best, but he tries. All right. So the goals are to establish a lasting peace and stability in Europe. Basically, no more wars. No more further French aggression and like keeping countries that are around France strong. So ones that border it like Belgium, like uh, the German states, like Italy, like Spain. And they want to restore royal families to thrones which were held before Napoleon's conquest. So like the Spanish monarchy would be reestablished because Napoleon, when he took over Spain, he put his own his brother in charge. So now that Napoleon's out of the way, they can get rid of Napoleon's brother's gone too. They can now reinstate the Spanish monarchy. They can put Germans back in charge of the German principalities, uh, things like that. All right, some actions. The Kingdom of the Netherlands is going to be formed. A German confederation is going to be formed. So basically a loose alliance of all the German speaking like minor kingdoms. Switzerland is going to gain independence. Uh, Genoa, a independent city in Italy, is going to become a part of the Kingdom of Sardinia, which is in northern Italy. France is going to be required to return territories conquered by Napoleon, but France is going to stay a big, a major player in Europe. All right. Now, some short term things conservatives are going to regain control of their governments. So they're going to start going back to the old styles of doing things. Uh, there's going to be a lot of revolts in, a, in colonies during this time. So that's like when we get the Latin American revolutions, Haitian revolutions, all this stuff is happening during this time as well. All right, some long-term legacy things. 
we do get an age of peace in Europe for a number of years to follow. France's power is going to be diminished and Britain and Prussia are going to come into power. They're going to be the top two countries in Europe militarily and with like government power as well. All right, nationalism is going to grow in many countries during this time. This is basically going to set the grounds for how World War I is going to start. And when we get to World War I, you will understand why, because the word nationalism comes back into play. All right, Metternich's efforts to establish peace and stability. He wanted to create a balance of power in Europe. So like between the rival countries, so no country could be a threat to the others. So he's going to set up a bunch of alliances called the Concert of Europe, which requires nations to help one another if a revolution erupts. So say there is a revolution in Spain, Britain, France, Ger the German states, Russia, everybody's gonna jump in and help. If there's one in Russia, everybody's gonna help Russia. All right, balance of power doctrine. Leaders wanted to weaken France, but did not want to leave it powerless. No country would easily overpower the other. One of the most successful peace meetings in all of history, if you can believe that, it is true. All right, so the peace is going to last longer after this agreement longer than like any other time in European history, just to be honest about that. It's gonna last for over 40 years. That is a very big deal. All right, monarchies are gonna be restored and the new political map of Europe is going to be drawn, all right? New political philosophies are going to come into play such as liberalism and conservatism. All right, conservative and liberal. Conservative, usually wealthy property owners and nobility. This is in the early 1800s versions of these. So can't, don't apply this exactly to today. All right, they wanted to protect the traditional monarchies of Europe. The liberals, what they want is they are mostly middle-class people, business leaders, merchants. They want to give more power to elected parliaments, to Congresses. And only educated people and landowners should be allowed to vote. Okay, so now to tie it all up with these two maps here at the end, this is the map under Napoleon when basically what he and his family are in control over. And after the Congress of Vienna, everything's broken up. You have the establishment of new countries, new empires, states have been given independence. And yeah, so that is our wrap up for discussion on Napoleon. Hope you guys learned a little something about him. And that is going to do it for France for a little while. When we come back, we're going to be looking at some new revolutions that are going to happen in the mid-1800s. All right.